So do you remember where you were the first time that you heard Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard say the immortal words, I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man, I will not. It might have been on the day that it happened. It happened in 2012. You could have been in your car, heard it on the radio, watching on the six o'clock news, or maybe you saw it on a phone. Ooh. It might have been years later, uh, during a class at school or, or uni. However you became aware of it, there is no way that you can be unmoved by it. Misogyny in this country is a sad fact of how many systems are set up, how they are maintained, and indeed how they are defended. I wish I could say we've come a long way since the day in 2012. We've moved the needle a little, but to be honest, we're really, we're just getting off the plane at the airport in Nepal and the, the summit of Mount Equality is still a long, long way away. We're going to need a guide if we want to stand any chance of, of making an attempt at the summit. And this is where someone like Hannah Ferguson comes in. Hannah is the co-founder and CEO of Cheek Media Company, which is an independent Australian news commentary platform providing, I guess, informed progressive opinions on subjects that sit really, I guess, at the intersection of social issues, political issues, and feminist issues. And since I discovered Hannah's work, I've, I've been absolutely floored with just the elegant clarity that Hannah can use to describe what are often very complicated issues, but always with a trademark cheeky grin. You see, it's in the, it does what it says on the box. Because that the kind of angle that she takes disarms biases and allows ideas into my head in a, in a way that they, are, they haven't got in there before. And it's, it's brilliant. Hannah is an incredibly powerful, very clever woman at 25. She's an absolute weapon of passion and drive to make informed, progressive, expansive opinion on not just feminism, but yeah, social issues political issues. Some of us are quite lucky and we know that what we want out of life very early. When Hannah was just 10, she, to her parents, professed a love for democratic voting after there was a school excursion to the office of the Australian Electoral Commission. Parents couldn't quite understand it, well, didn't know, understand what was going on, but that did not stop 10-year-old Hannah from setting a very solid goal she's going to become Prime Minister one day. Now, you'll hear in our conversation today uh, the reason that I do not want her to become Prime Minister. No, um, but we'll get to that. Hannah has just written a great book. Oh, where is it? It's on my desk here. It's called Bite Back. There it is there. That's the cover. That's what she looks like, the book that is. Uh, I'm holding it upside down because I'm very clever, but it's got an upside downy title, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, the book is called Bite Back, Feminism, Media, Politics, and Our Power to Change It All. It's a freaking amazing read, and it's a, a really magnificent lens to view, essentially, what modern Australia is like for a mid-20s person living through a housing crisis, a cost of living that's through the roof that you can't afford to pay rent on, inheriting a climate that looks nothing like the weather any of us grew up with. I, pr I promise it's funny. I promise it's levity. It's it's great. I'm so bloody grateful that people like Hannah Ferguson exist. She and I really clicked on so many levels, and I think I think you will too, because her thoughts on the patriarchy and its negative impacts on men, not just on women, are absolutely brilliant. Find her on Instagram, cheekmedia.co. The book's called Bite Back. Get it wherever you get your books. She's also got a podcast, which is great. It's called Big Small Talk. Big Small Talk. Get it where you got this podcast. I can't wait for you to hear from Hannah Ferguson. How are you feeling? Great. Thanks for having me. I love the. It feels like. What does it feel like, Hannah? Uh, like a like a probe, like a like a um, a crime show. And you're, I mean, the, the intensity of the lighting, lighting with the darkness, I like it. It's mm -hmm. quite serious energy, and I know it's not going to be as serious in the actual, maybe it is, in the substance. All right, Ferguson. <laughs> That's how I feel. 
Just explain to me exactly what the patriarchy has done. Can you, is that, <laughs> see, I mean, my heart's racing and it's like something I'm an expert in. <laughs> like, so occasionally, like, Audrey loves those shows. I can't, like, it, look, they're going to figure it out before the fourth ad break. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I, you know, she loves a procedural because you don't have to think too hard. It's the same beats every time. It's like pop music. First chorus, first chorus, middle eight. Key change, if you're lucky, chorus, chorus fade. Out. Very distinct pattern. You can rely on it. You can rely on it. If you're an actor and you are the first person we see in one of those shows, you are going to be dead within 30 seconds. <laughs> and if you're particularly famous on one of those shows, a guest appearance, you're probably the killer. Nearly every single time. Yep. It's like when Stephen Fry shows up in Morning Wars, like, and they just kind of fleetingly show him in a boardroom. I'm like, Stephen Fry didn't fucking say yes. To being an extra. <laughs> to showing up and going, well, I agree. And have one fucking line. No. Stephen Fry is going to show up and he's going to be the re- the end of that effort. Exactly. Which he was. Um, Good bet. It's a cr- I don't know if you watch Morning Wars, but it's pretty. I do. I've, but I've only seen the first season. Two seasons, maybe. Oh, they just started the third. Oh, okay. So I'm not that far behind. It's stunning. Slay. It's stunning. I do love. Well, I love it. I particularly like it because I think um, Witherspoon is just a weapon. And also, I've never been a big Jennifer Aniston fan, but I am. Yeah. I really am with this one. <laughs> really am. It's wild. Like last night, watching it with Audrey, I remembered the day, the day I woke up and realized I can never drink again, I interviewed her and uh, Jerry, the fucking... Mr. 300, what's his name? Gerald Butler. Oh. I interviewed the two of them. He's so hot. I, that day, <laughs> I'm sitting there talking to them while the night before was like, that was a, like, really, I woke up going, I can never do that again. Yeah. And I interviewed her that day. That's huge. Yeah. It's a great anecdote, even though it's a bit tragic. Uh, well, I got to stay alive. So, so that's nice. Good outcome. That was, I'm sure that is that, nice. That, is, that nice. is really nice. And it actually helped interviewing Jerry Butler that day because he, I don't even asked him about it during the interview. I kind of snuck it in there. And he, because he was sober. Mm. And he was like, oh, no, none of this would happen if I was still drinking. Fuck no. I was and like, you were like, oh. Really? You can have a career and not, mm, okay. Shocking. Yeah. Took a while. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Glad you. Well, I'm I'm glad you you showed up because I <laughs> I love I love the voice that you have in our country. It's really important. Thank you, and that's really nice from someone who is in media, all kinds of media. I don't have. I don't get to speak. None of the jobs I do are me speaking the way I feel about things. Huh. really. This job is, but none of the big TV jobs. How does that feel? Sorry, you're interviewing me, but I'm sort of interviewing you too. Um, it feels fine because I disagree with a lot of Gary Vaynerchuk's kind of way of the world, but he did write a really interesting book called Jab, 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 Right Hook, which is essentially you can't just be selling shit all the time. Yeah. You have to give value, give value, give value, give value, give value, give value. Buy this coffee cup. Value, 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 value. value. Yes. And that's the only way to do it. And so- all of those wonderful shows which I get to do, which I adore. And this work here means that I can get invited onto Q&A and go toe-to-toe and I'd like to think do a rather good job. Yes. Up against, yes. <laughs> up against certain, you know, quite high-profile people in our country. It's really fun. But, I mean, it's kind of fun that you get to have a go at everything. But also, I've never been invited on Q&A. It's a personal goal for me. Oh, really? Yes. So that's on my list. Oh, thank you. (laughs) I would love that. But What do you particularly want to do? Do you want to do workplace relations? Do you want to do – what are you interested in? I would want to do things about, like, uh, reform around sexual violence. Around, I I think that my passion area is always going to be women's issues, Mm. but I think that my skill is – challenging politicians on anything that I'm... And it, I mean, I do have a background in workplace relations, so I can speak to a bunch of different issues and my background is law. But I think more so my job is to make complex political ideas simple and strip the bullshit out of politics and the law for people. Well, that's really it, isn't it? Yeah. 
uh, because there is a deliberate, much like my old accountant, there's a deliberate obfuscation of things yes. that makes me feel and like, well, oh, I don't know. I This is obviously I'm not smart enough for this. I guess I'll just believe you. That's the thing. Which that, it isn't. No, it's not. And that's my whole shtick as well. Like I'm 25. I'm not claiming to be some expert in, in anything really. Mm. But I think that one of my greatest skills is the fact that I'm not really afraid to be wrong. I'm not really afraid to not have expertise and I'm not afraid to admit that. And I think that's what our country has a massive problem with. We don't know how to engage in healthy debate or discussion because people are terrified of not being seen as an expert or having knowledge. I think the voice referendum is a perfect example as well. People would rather do the, I, if you don't know, vote no, than actually admit to not being engaged and stepping up to the plate and trying to learn. Because I think that we just withdraw and become apathetic instead of admitting to not knowing everything. The idea of the you don't if you don't know, vote no. It is just anything that rhymes. I mean, stop the boats is good. It's a good fucking hook. It is. You know? I, but I this hate, is it's like thing. a pitbull song. I hate it. Yes. But fuck, there's a fireball sticks in your head. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like Stop the boats. It's a fucking good one. You know it. And you know, as soon as you heard, if you heard, if you don't know, vote no, I was like, oh, here we it fucking rhymes. go. Here it we rhymes. Go. Here we go. And I was like, it's, I mean, if it's easy for me to go, okay, what's the counteract straight away? But you can see it just like seeping in like disease mm. across the population and you're trying to race against the clock to stop it because there's no time. Yeah. And you can just see the hook. You can see the catch. And it's so obvious to me and you, but it's not obvious to everyone. Because people, I mean... The ongoing rhetoric in our country around politics is, excuse me, young lady, <laughs> smart man over smart here. Man. Smart man, sorry. Smart man I'll speaking. be very, very quiet. Me and every other guy that's ever had my job, pretty much all of us went to the same high school. So hold for it. Hold. Yeah, I don't think you understand. <laughs> the old power funnel from three Sydney elite boys' private schools. Truly is, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Like, it truly is. That's got to tell you something that things are a bit fucked up with the system yeah. that we have as government. And it cannot be. I think this is the thing that people get confused with, particularly uh, the work that you do, but sometimes when I speak about things, it's like, no, 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 no. I say the shit because I fucking love my country. And I would do anything. I love this country so much I became a citizen. I love it because there's a there's a better way to do it than it's being done. That stuff worked when we were communicating by mail and a piece of paper needed to literally go in a leather bag, be put on a horse. That horse went until it ran out of calories and then given <laughs> another horse and it took eight days to get to Melbourne. Yeah. And then, well, that's why government existed the way it did. That's very different now. Absolutely. Let's kind of... Kind of let's work things a little bit better now. People are far more informed and it's okay. It's okay to simplify things because it's not really that hard. No, it's not. And that's my whole point too. And part of the issue now is that with social media, I think it was like positioned as the great democratizer, right? But instead people are more fatigued than ever because mm. anything more than eight seconds and it goes in the too hard basket. If you're getting a point across and there's a little bit of complexity, I think then people are like, oh, I could just swipe on and get to a you know video of a puppy. And that is much easier than climate doom. Like you can understand why people are apathetic and disengaged because it's hard. But at the same time, we're over-complexifying everything and we're trying to sound smart. And that's what politics and the law does. It makes, it strings a whole bunch of nine-letter words together without really saying anything. And my whole point is to come back and say, this is what they've said, this is what they mean, here it is in one tweet. And people go, ah. Oh. And then they can go and have a conversation with their grandpa who's only watching Sky News about that very thing. Yeah. But it's bullshit. It's, how early, like, did you get in trouble at school for being this kid? No, I am goody two-shoes at school. I can't even express, like, I grew up in Orange in yeah, Central West New South Wales. I went to a Catholic conservative high school. I have conservative parents who voted Liberal National until last year. Wow. I remember, I graduated high school in 2016, and I remember that was when the same-sex marriage postal vote was ramping up, and I remember the rhetoric being so painful at that time. My parents were conservative and I had those views. I was confused as a 17, 18 year old. And I think that's what people forget is like, I think people go like, you're a radical lefty. And I'm like, I don't think you understand that in a very short amount of time, 
I have become like a radical critical thinker and I wasn't before and my upbringing was quite sh- not sheltered. My parents always challenged me to be, wanted me to be exactly who I am. But I wasn't the person in class that was like pushing these left-wing ideas. I was always intelligent and I was always a go-getter. But the political positioning and the ideas are new. And it's all been a process of challenging myself and really engaging with media literacy in a way that I've taught myself. So I think when people are like, you know, you're this like really extreme feminist, I'm like, not necessarily. I think that I'm just trying to challenge myself every day to think outside the box of what I previously thought. And I'm prepared to be wrong. Talk to me about becoming a critical thinker or like how do people start to scrutinise um, something that comes at them in that way? Yeah, I think a lot of the time when I'm having conversations with, say, my parents about this stuff, I think a lot of the time we come at it from a position of a win or lose mindset. Like I have to get this person to completely agree with my position or I've lost something. And if I can't get there, it kind of just devolves into a personal attack really quickly. And I always think the best thing to do, if you can, and if it's not an offensive, harmful debate, is to go at it and say, actually, what's the thing underpinning this? Because you're just repeating that liberals are better for the economy. Like my dad will go on and on about that. I'm like, what What do you think that actually means? Where mm-hmm. does that come from? What part of your upbringing or the media you consume has led to this view and how do I challenge what's underneath it, not what's on top of it? And I think it's about doing the same for your own views. Like if I'm confused about a particular cause or issue, I'm trying to examine why I feel confused and what my personal experience has been of, say, the group we're talking about or about what my parents taught me or what my childhood was like and how that relates to my perception of the issue, I think we get sensitive and defensive and that's really human and that's really normal, but it's kind of about having that emotional reaction, not reacting to it immediately, sitting back and then responding in a few days, taking your own time to think instead of feeling the need to constantly have something to add. And that if you're constantly having something to add, you're you're literally being reactionary. You are typing your thumbs just yes. fly in fury <laughs> yeah. fueled by this adrenaline rush which is ultimately what happens to our brains in those situations is they shut a lot of things down yeah. we go into kind of almost a tunnel way of looking at the world we think that'll protect us i think yeah and we think that it's better to have dug our heels in mm. than to have changed because i think that we see being um flexible or open to new ideas as being agreeable and that's somehow a weakness. But it's not. It's it's having a caveat and having nuance and that's actually the sort of, I think that's how we should measure intellect because it's not really about how you react to being right, it's how you react to being wrong that is kind of the measure for me of your character. If anyone has driven from Sydney to Brisbane, as I have, mm. there's a great new bypass. It's like 160, <laughs> it's literally 165 new kilometres of dual carriageway. It's fucking I haven't un- even been on, I think. fucking unbelievable, man. However, you will find yourself adjusting the steering wheel to stay within the lane probably, I don't know, three or four times mm. a minute. Now, if you didn't, you're going 110 kilometres, 110 kilometres an hour, <laughs> sir, your honour. You're doing 110 kilometres an hour. If you didn't adjust that, within 90 seconds, you would be in a guardrail or you would be in the bush and you would be dead. Yeah. But we have all agreed, no, 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 we're going to end up in Brisbane. But I'm just adjusting. Just slightly just adjusting. Just adjusting as I go. New information. That's all it is. Yep. That's truly, truly all it is. Yes. Yet it's seen as, or oh, if you just do a little bit, what's going to happen? That's exactly right. What's going to happen is like, what, you don't trust that we'll figure it out? we figured out everything else so far. I believe that we'll figure it out. Let's just go that way. Agree that we're getting trying to get from here to there. And we're going to be all right, guys. We're going to be all right. But there's very little money to be made in that kind of chat. So interesting. I, see, I don't find that because I feel like I've, I've tr- I'm trying to build something. Yes, there is a portion of what I do that is inflammatory ideas get the most shares. And I hate that, but it's the reality that we live in. But at the same time, I think constantly coming back to this idea of admitting to being wrong publicly has actually driven higher levels of following and engagement and sort of like fandom, I would say, in a sense for Cheek. Like, I think that part of my success has been the genuine transparency around, I fucked that. You know, Mm. people aren't used to that. People aren't used to someone saying, this is why I have this idea about this thing and this is what happened in my childhood that affected my view of it. I think people are just used to someone coming out and taking this hardline stance and being like, my way or the highway. Yeah. And I think that building a platform on potentially being wrong and being okay with that and saying this is exactly how how you can be wrong in the best and most honest way and move forward with new information 
is sort of just like gobsmacking to people. That almost in itself is the viral thing of Cheek. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't know that was possible in our landscape at the moment. Well, that's the thing. You can't, I say it all the time, you can't be what you can't see. And right now we've got our opposition leader who is an ex-Queensland cop who was a cop <laughs> in the late 80s and early 90s. <laughs> Right around the Bjorki Peterson, coming out of the Bjorki Peterson era, which I grew up in, mm. it was a utterly fucked, super racist place to be. Yes. This is a man who was in law enforcement at that time. There would be, and you know, he's shared about it, there would be views of the world that were shaped by those experiences. Absolutely. And I get, man, I get why he would not want to talk about that as how it influences how he feels. <laughs> the idea that he would ever be swayed from that, you know, I'm a tough on crime ex cop, yeah. here I go. Hey, really? What are you just going to run out of prisons if you keep throwing children in there, mate? Oh, but, but so this what's going to happen? But I also look at someone like Peter Dutton and I'm like, you are not the future of this country. And I think that even the most staunch liberal voters know that. I think someone like Peter Dutton is so far departed from the reality of modern Australian society. And yes, I know that I do have a very specific view and, a sp and to a degree an echo chamber that I live in. But I think that the future does not look like someone who's an ex-Queensland cop. And I think we all know that because, again, yeah, even the people who are Liberal supporters would not back him in. And I think that they're betting on the wrong horse because even if this referendum were to fail, Peter Dutton wouldn't gain much traction, I think. I've met him. I actually was campaigning for the Labor Party and he approached me in a Labor shirt, greeted me, had a full conversation with me and was nice as pie. It was genuinely one of the most jarring experiences of my life because I did not expect him to be more likeable in person. Where was this? It was in his electorate. I was actually campaigning against him on pre-poll. Right. Yes. So and this so is up in... Uh, it's, it's north of Brisbane. Yeah, north of Brisbane. I, oh, what's the name what's of the it? What's the electorate? I um, know it. It's not Stanthorpe. Dixon. It's Dixon. Dixon, yes. Dixon. Exactly. I have relatives that live there. Yeah. And so it's I right was, below. It's a Pine River Shire. It's yeah, up, I was in yeah, Strathpine or something. Yeah, yes. Strathpine. That's yes. it. Yeah, yeah. And I was on the pre-poll and I was standing there handing out how to vote. Just, I would have handed how to vote out for anyone but him, right? Yeah. And I thought, here we go. We, we're going to get him out. Is he a tall man? Yes. He's, yeah. I'm six foot two. He's probably my height or slightly taller. And he, I met him twice or three times during my period pre-polling and he every single time came up and said hello to me and tried to have a conversation with me. I wasn't very receptive to the conversation, but I'm not going to just completely ignore someone. I did say hello to him. What kind of things was he asking? Um, he was just wanting to know how my day was. He was right. just having a general conversation, but I was interested to know that, like, even though I was obviously on the other side to him, he still, even if it was for public appearances, he still bothered to come and have a conversation with me. He also had this strange posse of older women, like about, I would say, five to ten 60 year old plus women would just follow him around like oh peter it was very strange what, experience like carrying his stuff or just just wanting to be in his orbit whoa like they were his fan club it yeah, was yeah. and it was all women it was really strange to me watching it wow yeah it was i mean disturbing but i think it's an important anecdote because i disagree with everything that person says i genuinely don't think i've ever heard something he said and thought good take and I still was really interested in the fact that people generally who have met him say he's nicer in person. It's quite fascinating. Yes. Yeah. I, I heard the same thing about, I did some campaigning for uh, James Matheson when he ran in the Warringah electorate oh, yeah. um, against Abbott. Yes. A couple of years back. And I remember I was handing out leaflets and he walked in to the primary school where we were and he walked dick first. Like really? Just crotch. He walked. How shall I put this? Out? He walked with his hips being the f the, the first part of his body that Jesus. travels into the space ahead of him, kind of like Conor McGregor, but without the arms. <laughs> the mental image so is like, serious, but without the arms. Yeah, you know, Conor McGregor does the yeah. It's walk, just the hip first. It was hips yeah. first. The hips were in front of his knees as he walked, and um, it was very very odd how he just strode and it, yeah, it it was kind of weird. Actually, I was speaking with um. Um, a mate the other day and his son uh, goes to one of those schools that we, oh no, he doesn't, but a similar school to ones we were just speaking about. And he was talking about around the old boys in that school that there's a real problem that these guys, they get to the age of 40 and they've gone to school, they've never had 
any problems that always know like, well, I'll be looked after. They go to uni, they're hanging around everybody, they're, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. If they get into trouble, one of dad's mates will get them out of trouble. They, you know, if they don't go well at uni, there's a job with someone's mates, dad's, whatever. They meet, you know, the girl from the other school and everything's fine and fine and fine and they never get said no to. And then yeah. they get to 40 and then there's a divorce or there's a sickness or there's something. And it's literally the first time they've ever experienced adversity. Holy shit, this is so relevant to what I've been thinking about at the moment. Keep going. And then they, and then they fall into a completely crumpled heap because uh -huh. they have no fucking skills yep. to deal with being told no or things aren't going your way right now, pal. Yep. And they're in their 40s. Yeah. And they're crippled by it. They're, yeah. they're completely debilitated and it's really interesting the way that people can only, uh, many people in our community only understand activism or advocacy through the lens of something that's happened to them. Yeah. They can't actually perceive, and I don't know if it's an empathy or sympathy issue, but it's it's really interesting the way that people are completely unwilling to even attempt to, to consider the lived experience of others. And what's, the reason I've been thinking about this a lot lately is, one, I'm pretty determined to be the prime minister, so I have to think about people like this and how they get into these power funnels and how they get there if I want to challenge that. But two, um, I hosted a book launch for Chanel Contos last week, her book Consent Laid Bare, and one of the anecdotes in the book was she was talking about elite Sydney boys' private school culture, and she was recalling a story f between one of her friends, I think, that was going to two formals with the boys from a public school and a private school, and she went to the public school formal the first weekend, and her dad said nothing. He was like, have a great night. And the second weekend, before the private school formal, the dad took her aside and was like, this is how you say no, this is what you do, pick me, tell, like, call me if you need, like, blah, 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 Whoa. blah. And she was like, what the hell, Dad? And he said, these boys have never been told no. Uh. And I was like, Ugh. I was like <laughs> nauseous, but I, it just makes perfect sense. And that's exactly it. It's like the first time these people face adversity, the resilience isn't there and they don't know how to bounce back from it. It becomes this like pit of misery for their life. Yeah. I don't want you to be prime minister. Really? No. Why? Because I want you to be president. Oh, I'm a Republican. See too. what I did there? <laughs> yeah, I really liked it. I was like, why? I'm See sure what I did there? I'm with you. So I'm a, I'm a broadcast professional. I don't, to, <laughs> I don't know how to make a moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't want you to be prime minister. I want you, to, or, or I want you to be the very last prime minister we ever have. That's what I was going to say. I'm the person that would become prime minister and then hold the next referendum. I am. Yeah, that's kind of. I think that's what it's going to have to be because yes. I, I was very. It's been quite clear that the person who ends up our prime minister is not generally the person who's the best at leading no. the country. They're the best person at playing all the bullshit, stupid fucking games I have to play in those party rooms to be the person who is the one in the top job. They're not the best leader. I agree. And my question is, like, obviously I'm quite outspoken and people would call me, people would call me controversial, even though I don't really think anything I'm saying is particularly crazy. But for me, it's like this question of why do these people have these really strong views, they get into the political parties and they're just watered down and watered down. And it's because they want to rise. It's because they want to get to cabinet and they want to become PM. But there's just no backbone. And for people like Albanese, I think that his early political career indicated some serious strength. And then I watch him now and I'm like, I, come on. Like, I just think they're playing it so safe and it's pathetic. Yeah. It's so pathetic. And for me, I'm like, I'm quite determined to have a go and fail, but stick to my guns this way. And I yeah. think that that's what this country needs. I don't think we've had a visionary for a very long time. I think we've uh, we had one. We had one. It was so good that the CIA staged a coup. <laughs> that's the one. Like there was, I'm not even, I'm not even no. making that up. No, that actually happened. <laughs> you know, Whitlam showed up and was like, "Fuck this noise," <laughs> and just created, just. Boof, like it's near, not even a full term. No. And then the you know the Americans got involved, and then one thing led to another, and then Norman Gunston's there, and then it's over. <laughs> yes, but I would rather go out that way. <laughs> yeah. Than absolutely but, shit on my values. But look at the things that that is a tiny brief amount of time. Look at the things that got set in motion. Yeah. Like, wild, absolutely mind blowing. Yes. And and yeah, that I thought for a little bit that I'd be interested in getting into it. But then I'm like, I don't want to play that game with, I don't, I don't want to play that game. I would rather play a game where we're both trying to cook dinner for a table of people that not everybody likes the same food and you and me are going to have to figure it out versus I will fight you until we go to the drive through Yeah. Which is the game we play at the moment. That's a really, I like the metaphor. I like the analogy. I, I want to play the game though. I really yeah, right. do, but maybe I'm. Maybe it's too early. Maybe I'm making the call without being involved. Well, you've been to law school, so you've kind of got a bit more of the tools. I don't have any of those tools, man. 
But I think that we're lacking a lot of personality and grit. It's not really about the law school thing. I think it's about, I think that the law degree often gives people this entitlement to these ideas and systems when actually they're not willing to dismantle them. Look, I think for me... uh, there's there are great music producers that have no no musical skill, you know, but I think the greatest music producers are the ones that understand how chords work. All right, you kind of have to understand what's in the toolbox. To uh, you know, you might only ever use the hammer and the screwdriver, but you need to know that should you require it, the monkey wrench is in there. You know, <laughs> yeah. the, there's there's a tool that can do just that. <laughs> there's an adjustable hex bit somewhere, and that's how we're going to get this done. I. I like that, but I think we need a mix. Yeah. Like, I think that in every every parliament, there should be a mix of working class people. I don't think any of these people are truly working class. Like, no. besides, like, Jackie Lambie, I really don't think many. Oh, don't forget Pauline. But I don't think there's she many people. She hasn't been working class for a while, man. Oh, I know. I know. I think you do lose it. But what I mean is I think... I like the idea Long of the- Long time she's, since, since she's not like fish and chip I was, You know, I only found out about the fish and chip shop what, like two really? weeks ago. I didn't oh, know. I, I was there. I was in Queensland when it all went down. Oh, shit. That is such a great anecdote. I did not know that the woman that's fought quite against the plight of women in parliament for a very long time. Yeah, she's the old fish and chip owner. I can't believe that. There was a song by a band and there was the, she is the fish and chip from Ipswich. There was another word that rhymed. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Add to Spotify after You'll this. You'll find it. You'll find it. There was a number of songs about her. Oh. oh yeah, I know. I, I know. And, it, and it's weird. You know, that stuff's particularly weird. And stunt, the stunts that this particular person pulls, I think it's indicative of our system of government. I'm very, I'm, I'm all about de- democratic reform. I'm all about getting money out of politics. I'm all about, you know, the, you know, that's like, that's like an Australian crew, the Change Politics crew. They helped Ireland repeal the eighth. Like, they're fucking unbelievable, these mm. guys. I've worked with them a bit. And it's citizen juries, sortition. It's really smart stuff. Yeah. And they come up with really, really clever examples and demonstrations to go, no, this actually works. But this is how they decided on, like, abortion laws in Ireland, that's isn't they, it? The most conservative yeah. country, most conservative Catholic country on the planet. Th- that's how um, the Teals are putting forward the idea of a citizens' assembly for rent, for housing. Precisely. Yes. I interviewed Allegra Spender about it because I'm really interested in this idea yeah. of having the actual distribution be correct and having people actually come to the table and say, mm. this is my view, this is a... Abs- because we all know that the people who are voted into our parliament are the people most likely to have investment properties. <laughs> and it's like, you're voting on something how and why like you really should be abstaining if you have an investment property on voting on renters rights and rent freezes like and this is the thing is that people listening to this going oh my god and it's like it's actually not that hard they want you to think it's complicated but there's so many ideas on the table as to how this could be fixed who's to gain by complicating things so much uh, I think that when you disguise systems of power and over and make things overly complicated, you f- make the public feel like they're not allowed to step up and challenge you. I think we limit the ability for protest reform and change when people feel so blinded by the system that they can't engage with it. I think when we like, and I think one of the simple examples is, you know, in Queensland a couple of weeks ago, they suspended their own Human Rights Act and overrode the act overnight to allow them to cage children in adult police watch houses. So they they got advice from the Solicitor General that what they had been doing for decades was potentially unlawful and there was a case challenging that. So instead of changing anything, they suspended the act and, and changed the act overnight. They pushed through amendments attached to another bill, right? They then think about something like affirmative consent legislation. That took years. That took millions in funding for task forces. That took bureaucratic nightmares to say when someone's consenting to a sexual act, they need a positive indication of that consent. When we look at how people make laws and how fast change can happen, when they want something done to cover their own ass, it's an overnight example. And when we want positive change to help the community, it's years-long millions of dollars of funding bureaucratic bullshit. And I think that the public just don't know because we're being held at arm's length and told, you don't get it. You're not welcome here. We're the ones in charge. And that's my point. That's my problem is, like, I don't necessarily think we shouldn't be having a big research task force into affirmative consent. But look at the difference. Compare the pair, you know, same age, same income, same super contribution. It's not really great. That's fucking crazy. (laughs) It is. (laughs) It is. That's not okay. And my thing is, like, I think they don't want you to know 
Because if you know, you challenge, you push back, you don't put your vote there. Yeah. I don't think the population has good media literacy or legal literacy. And I have a big belief that everyone should have a basic understanding of our legal system that should be taught in school. Mm. Um, Because I think that when you understand, I think people don't even understand the the language they're reading in um, newspaper articles about what beyond reasonable doubt means, what the presumption of innocence is. We're seeing these massive cases, especially in the sexual violence space, where there's comment sections filled with red Holden Commodore profile pictures of men saying, but the presumption of innocence. I'm like, you don't know what that means. And I think that we all need to be better educated to have better conversations where we're not just playing this game of who can offend who the most. So on the the day we're speaking about is is the day that the man who owns the news is stepping down as the, as the boss. Yeah. Uh, Rupert Murdoch is uh, stepping down from the... And it's like... What did you just copy paste Logan Roy's speech? Yeah, I know because it literally it's like it's exactly that episode of Succession. New You're, Succession season just dropped. You are it's the, it's it. Yeah, you're doing it. Yeah, and on that day we are having this conversation. So you talk about media literacy. Mm. What are some things around media literacy that you, you think is just just important? Just what are some things people should know? I think some basic things that people should be doing is when you read an article, Google who owns the masthead. Google who owns that paper. Um, I would potentially also just try, whenever you're reading a piece, read it from one other source owned by one different person. It doesn't have to be three or four, but I would say always read every piece of news from two different sources just to compare the way they're writing about it. I think what I do a lot is try and make an example of different headlines. So one of the things I constantly think about is Anne Rose, this organisation, did a study in 2016 where they looked at like thousands of articles about um, domestic violence. In 60% of the articles, the headline didn't name the perpetrator. They were completely invisible. And I don't mean name as in their actual name. I mean, it was like woman killed. Right. There's no existence of the person who killed her, which is usually a man and usually her partner or and someone she's had a, some sort of intimate relationship with. And when we look at our headlines, we're actually missing the picture. And I think that when we don't actually look at what we're reading and consider the facts of, okay, let's compare this source against this source and let's look at the facts. Let's Google that word we don't understand. Mm. Media literacy, I think, is about reading a piece and sitting back and going, what are my questions that are arising from what I just read? Did you read it in full or did you just go to the headline and look at the comment section? Did you Google another source? Did you Google who owns it? They're really basic things and they're just a really simple starting point, but people aren't doing it because I think that we've just been taught that once we've engaged with something in one way, okay, that's the information I need. And I think we've been taught to trust the news when actually there's no better time to have a deep mistrust and to challenge the conditioning we're facing. Sometimes I watch Sky News for fun. I genuinely, I... It's pretty fun. I, it is. And I think it's so important for someone like me to read The Australian on a Sunday, cover to cover, because I need to know what I'm up against. And it's no use for me to get on the internet and get really angry about something if I don't know what I'm talking about. I agree with that. Where is the line between falling backwards down the slippery dip of, um, or, or, you know, the mainstream media like rabbit hole <sighs> at some point? You have to understand that there is a truth somewhere. So how do you how do you stop yourself? Because that's what's happening at the moment. People are literally they're just like falling down rabbit holes, and it's really scary. Yeah. How do you how do you stop yourself? At what point do you go? Okay, so that's the person that owns it, but some this thing must have happened. At some level of this thing must have happened. I think it's also about always having questions arise about the practicality of the system. So that sounds a bit again complicated, but what I mean is. Something like the Bruce Lerman trial has been a really controversial topic in over the last couple of years, basically. But also, the media's calling it the Brittany Higgins trial. She's not on trial. She's, She's a complainant trial. witness. That's the first point, right? Yeah. So I can read 10 headlines where it says the Brittany Higgins trial, but when I read it, I go, hmm, she's actually the complainant witness, so it's not that, and just actually go back to the system that underpins it and what's actually happening here. That's not easy for people who don't have a law degree to do. I get that. But I think it's about coming back and going, okay, I understand why my dad might not ultimately uh, question or believe Britney automatically because there is a standard of proof which is beyond reasonable doubt. And when you look at the evidence, there actually isn't an ability to prove beyond reasonable doubt that this occurred. So I can understand why many people on the internet are confused 
But that's actually enraging people and it's becoming a pick a side. For me, it's about reading an article and going, I actually don't have to take a stance where I'm picking a side or picking a win-lose. Mm. We're so deeply engaged in the false binary and this idea that every issue has two hardline stances. When I'm reading a news piece, I'm trying to create questions not about what my view is, but about how to think about it in a different way. So I'm going, okay, I'm reading this, this is what's happening today in the trial or in the inquiry, and I'm just trying to put together a list of five facts. And when I talk about it, I'm not necessarily going to, I believe this person, I'm going to, these are the facts of what's happened today. This, it was in court, this is what happened, this is what the DPP said, this is what Walter Sofronoff said, this is what occurred. I don't have to make a decision. I don't have to have an opinion necessarily even. Mm. I just have to learn something and take something away Google the word, Google the masthead. It's not always about this polarizing positioning. And that's what I think people don't get. And that's how I kind of avoid sometimes falling down the rabbit hole is like, you don't have to have this aggressive take on everything. It seems like I do to everyone, but I don't. I think it's more about the way we think about things and set up the way we read and reflect on information. Mm. You don't have to battle something and you don't have to believe or not believe. You can hold multiple truths at once. I don't think society is willing to do that right now. I don't. Uh, the, you mentioned a few times that you have a controversial or an, people call you controversial. People mm. say you have an aggressive stance. Mm. I don't think you do. That's the, nice. That was true though because it's something that I've, I've run into myself. It's like I found the ABC Vote Compass to be a very useful thing. Yes. Because I did it and I surprised myself. Did you? Yes, because it turns out my right shoulder leans on the centre, you know? Yes. I'm, I'm that close to it. Like I'm standing on the left-hand side of it, but I'm literally just like leaning on it. Yeah. I'm leaning on that. I was like, Christ on the cracker. Because when I feel how I feel and I look at the world and I look at the way the world's being reported, I'm like, I must be like wearing a linen shirt and smelling like patchouli. I yes, must be a screaming yes. fucking yeah. like pinko lefty. What yeah. the fuck? No, it's just... The vast amount, the volume, the volume of the way the news is reported is coming from a place that's so way over there that I feel. Yes. But, but I'm not. No, I completely at agree. All. At all. I'm a fucking capitalist. I'm here to make money. Yeah. You know? <laughs> no, totally. But I'm the same. I actually, I actually wrote in the book about the vote compass specifically because part of my thing is about how... In this country, I think we have this real addiction to blind loyalty. And I don't mean like supporting your footy team who are wooden spooners. I think that's heartwarming. But well, good people of North are getting very excited because <laughs> they're about to have their first New South Wales Cup grand final in 30 something years. <laughs> very exciting. They've never won one. 101 years, they've never won it. That's where blind loyalty may prevail, finally, yeah. right? But I mean to political parties and people. Like these aren't people that should have fandoms, they're elected officials, right? Yeah. And for me, part of it is like, someone will do the vote compass and get so deeply wounded because they've been, like, tooting Tony Abbott's horn for a decade <laughs> yeah. and they're actually a greenie when they put their views into the vote compass and answer a series of questions. And, like, I tell this story that when I was 10, after a netball game, I went to vote um, with my dad and he – it was the – it was I think it was the Rudd, Rudd election – and he came away from it and we went home and he said, I voted for so-and-so. And mum was like, that's the Labor candidate. And he was like, no, it's not. And they were like, you could hear like the distress because my parents are Liberal National voters. Like they're, they're coalition through and through. And so dad's like shitting his pants. And mum's like, that's the Labor candidate. And he's like, but I read the how to vote and her policies were better. And he was like, you could hear like the venom in his voice. And he was like coming to terms with the fact that he's just read these pamphlets and genuinely just voted blind. Wow. For the Labor candidate. Wow. And so he was like, and then he tried to own it and be like, whatever. Like, blah, blah, blah. I could feel the just like the venom and the confusion. And it's such a good metaphor for Australian voters that when you are presented with something that may challenge your views but that you align with, you're confused because you've chosen mm. and you feel like you're stuck there. And when you're presented with something else, we're so immovable often. But I think that's just like the perfect representation of the fact that when you actually, when it actually comes down to a lot of the time, we're being fed this rhetoric that's not actually aligned with our views, but we're so unwilling to sort of move the needle. I find this all completely fascinating. So that just anecdotally, there's a story I've told before that um, my – uh, ben, uh, who I, I work with, his dad met his mum at a Liberal Party dance <gasps> in the 60s, maybe 50s. Yeah. All right. Liberal voted their whole lives, like Northern Beaches, Insular Peninsula, like you fucking name it. Like, yes. Or everything's white and off up there. All right. And now 
well, his his uh, his father's uh, passed away, uh, uh, unfortunately. But I think the last f- uh, ten years or something, his father became a Greens voter, and Ben was asking him, going, "What happened?" He goes, "I never changed. How I feel about the world never changed, but the policies of the party changed, and how Whoa. I feel about the world is now repped by the Greens." Now take that into account. Like the, what the Greens are now is what the Liberal Party in Australia was in the 60s. So we kind of, sometimes when we look back in history, we go, oh, it was a liberal government. Yeah, but the liberal government of the time. Yeah. You really want to have your mind blown? Watch Ronald Reagan and George Bush in the 1980 Republican candidacy debate talking about Mexican immigration. Oh. It'll, your brain will fucking splatter. It is unbelievable because these two men, it's like you're literally watching Obama and Clinton trying to out nice each other on immigration, and these are this George 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 H W. Yeah. So the forty one Bush forty one. Yes. Crazy. It's fucking unbelievable. Like to how much the parties have changed over the years. That's what they stood for at yes. the time. They still feel like they, they're our friends. We need to be aligned with them. You know, this is who they are, and they are good people and they're kind people. 20 years later, there's not, they're sending the worst, they're sending the rapists, they're sending the blah, 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 blah. Oh, and this is what I mean. Now it's go work, go broke. Now yeah. it's this like, you know what I mean? And it's like, what are you talking about? Matt, it rhymes. Look, if uh, it, it rhymes. I'm telling you, this rhymes. Hannah, if it rhymes, what are we going to do? I would love it because I've been trying to figure this out as well. It's like people call me, what, what the fuck is woke? Like, tell me. I don't know. I can. Woke literally means being aware and in tune with social issues, and it has a particular element where it's talking about racial issues. That's literally what the definition of the word means. To be woke is to care and be aware of social justice causes. And Murdoch Media has made it that you are this hippie, weird fuck if you're woke, and it's demonised the word woke. And these, these outlets make the language of progress and equality fear, division, And they demonise it. That's literally what it is. To be woke is to be aware. It's to care. That's that's. I cannot even express that. That's it. But we are people that care about each other. We we care about. (laughs) When did caring about another person mean that I would not make any money? It's dangerous. (laughs) It's dangerous to dear Rupert. It is dangerous to give a shit about anyone other than yourself and your own pockets. Truly, that is my only answer for that. There's a great there's a great line I can't remember his name but it was a, a book written by like the ex Fox News EP or, or something like that and he he talked about the amount of money they made feasting on fear. It's a commodity. It truly is. Yeah. And you're really seeing it now, and it blows my mind. But emotion is hard won. It is. It's really hard won. And it's way easier to stoke that feeling in me. Yes. Than care. Yes. <laughs> Hope is a really really precious, and fear is everywhere. So what are we going to do, Hannah? Fucked if I know. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, yo, this is a great way to start your campaign. Look, I'm really. <laughs> I think that was inspiring. Put that on a T-shirt. Um, I... Obama did. It was just his face <laughs> and the word hope. Get but, Shepard Fairey onto it. He'll sort you out. But I, I, well, actually, should I should get more T-shirts. I think that the hope thing, like, again, I think the referendum. Your face, Shepard Fairey, woke. W- go woke. Oh, I need to come up with another rhyme. It's got to rhyme with cheek because you've got to get your brand in there. Do you think I can take cheek to the polls, though? Do you really think I can campaign to, for politics using this current platform? I feel like that's dangerous. No, I reckon you can. I reckon you can. All right. Because, uh, I mean, I was in Perth recently, which is Sandra Sully described on this show, she described TV in the 80s when she started as a billionaire's fiefdom. And in Western Australia, it still is. It's run by one person. Yes, yes. It's run by one person who owns the mines, he owns the newspaper, he owns the, the TV news. Twiggy. Uh, no, 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 oh, no. No, not Twiggy. Um, Is it Seven West? Uh, yes. Yeah. Two million people watch their news. Oh, so. Uh, well, yeah, something like that. It's like millions and millions of people watch the 6 p.m. news in Perth. It's, it's it's fucking amazing. But I was there and I was looking around and I was like, the youngest person who watches the 6 p.m. news in Perth 10 years ago, is still the youngest person who watches the 6pm news in Perth. Absolutely. So time is on your side Mm. because I think the way you're speaking to the world, and this is what I adore about the way you speak about the world, the way you speak about the world is not necessarily of any agenda other than, hey, 
human beings. <laughs> Over there's another human being. Let's not degrade anybody by going from here to there. Okay? That's it. Yes. I think that's a pretty okay thing to agree with. I, You know what? I tend to feel the same way about what I say. <laughs> I just don't see what is so radical about basic human decency. And I think we've lost that. I think that respect, decency, and the ability to converse with an understanding of the other person's experience. It has been lost in this country. I don't know for how long. I mean, again, I'm 25. I I didn't expect the success of Cheek. I didn't expect it. I didn't think I was saying anything particularly profound, and I don't think I am. I just think when we've not heard it for a long time, and we've not heard it in a way that's palatable and accessible. And I think that especially in the left, in inverted quotations, there is this infighting that will break us. The toxicity is horrific, and I'm trying to oppose that because the right doesn't have it. The right just goes, there's there's Pauline Hanson, she can just keep doing what she's doing, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. They're not actually trying to tear each other down. And I'm not saying there's no space for criticism or accountability. That's quite the opposite. If you're harmful, if you're hateful, that's not okay. But there's this failure to see the ability for disagreement on different issues. You're not going to have everyone see eye to eye on the way we should approach our theory of change. And I think that on different issues, we can have different seats at the table and we should have different expertise speaking. But I think that the left's biggest struggle is to accept that sometimes slow progress has to be the way. And I don't want that. No one wants that. But it has to be the way sometimes because we can't burn it to the ground and expect to wake up tomorrow with a new world. It's not going to happen. And so for me, it's about how we have conversations now that strengthen every link in the chain and take one step forward together. And we're really bad at that. And I'd like to bring it back together. And that's how hope, I think, is built and, and sustained. I have this idea that we create something entirely new, the, something entirely fucking new, the middle of the bell curve, the 64% of people that voted for um, marriage equality in yeah. this country voted for. It was a post-referendum. It was yeah. better. Not even referendum. It was a post Plebiscite, yeah. Plebiscite. It was fucking bullshit. Um, they, sh- they should have just fucking ticked a pen. And just, yeah. Uh, but it, I, I just have this, like, call, I don't know, call it something. Call, yeah. <laughs> call, call it meet me in the middle. I don't know. Yes. Call it something. It's like, okay, and see to see that radical, that kind of fracturing left as, like, I love you, man, and it's part of the problem. I do. I swear to God, you're awesome, and you make really good luxa, but yes, <laughs> it's part of the problem. Yes. It's as much part, and you don't want to admit it, it's as much part of the problem as that person over there. Sorry. <laughs> no, agreed. Agreed. And But also, wh- why is it that every time we want change in this country, it's like this progressive fantasy until it happens, or that the society's going to crumble? I mean, that's the right, but it's like the referendum is a perfect example. Like, before marriage equality, it was like, and people are going to want to start marrying their dogs. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? It's the same with the referendum now. Yeah. And if we do this, it's going to be we're going to have to pay to go to the beach. What are you, talk- what are you talking about? But yeah. no one has the ability to cut through this shit. Yeah. And, like, retain healthy conversation and, like, actually understand the logic behind all of this. Yeah. There's no logic. It's, it is it is very difficult when you then, if you go back with what you're talking about, because I have... And I, uh, someone I worked with for a long time, we don't work too much to get out anymore, but one of the smartest people I've ever known and bananas climate denier, like proper really? fucking mega, like rabbit hole in, like gone. And I had to work really hard on understanding that, oh, that view of the world had become melded to their self-identity. And so if I said to this person, well, hang on a sec, mate, like here is the graph. Yeah. All right. You keep talking about Ice Age. Here's the Ice Age graph. Look at the time scale on that. Yeah, absolutely. It was at that temperature before. You are right. And the time scale is that was thousands of years. Yes. This is 40 years. That has never happened before in history. Mm-hmm. And then it was then just like the repugnant, like, God, like it was a personal assault. Open wound. And therefore everything stopped. Yeah. And it's really hard. Yeah. It's it really fucking hard once that view becomes attached to someone's sense of identity, which often happens around people's parents. Like your father talking about the yeah. labor thing was wild. Yeah. I but love that. There's also a spectrum of ignorance, right? There's a spectrum of conversation that we can have. There's people that are just unaware, uninformed, uneducated potentially. There's people that are willfully denial, denying. And then there's those sort of people where they've attached the view to their identity where so whereby every time you even ask a question, you are fundamentally attacking who they are and you actually cannot have a healthy conversation with that person. Like I, I don't encourage people to try 
and converse with them because you're never going to win. You 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 should call your parents and your auntie and uncle before you should call that friend of yours that's an incel on the the deep dark corners of the web. Like that's too far gone. <sighs> You know what I mean, though? There yeah. is a distinction. And I'm not saying, oh, well, you know, we give up on those members of society, but I'm saying when you're trying to engage and trying to make change, you're going to run yourself in circles and become fatigued and burned out if you dedicate all of your energy to the person that cannot be moved. You have to channel the middle. You have to find the healthy spectrum of conversation because if you're putting yourself in harm's way, there's no use either. But it's also about identifying your privilege. Like, you know, I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of anyone. That's not okay. But, you know, for me as a white person, if my grandfather says something problematic about First Nations people, it is my responsibility to step in and say that's not okay because he's going to say it to someone who is a First Nations person. And if you can interject and stop that, it's your obligation as a person. I truly believe that. And being able the skills to say that without because that can be taken as like, well, now you don't love me. This is no, a- granddad, I do. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying it. Because is- you raised me to be a kind person, you raised me to be kind to other people. And that is an unkind thing to say, granddad. I find this one of the hardest spaces in these conversations, and I think it's the thing we don't talk about, is like when our loved ones say problematic things, offensive things, it actually really destabilises the love that we have for them because I suddenly go... If I love this person that has these views, what does that mean about our love and what mm. does that mean about our relationship? And it's really hard. That's why we all avoid it. Yeah. You know, that's why it's vulnerable. It's emotionally exposing. Yeah. And it's challenging. But you do have the privilege of a safer relationship and an ability to get through. It's all about how. It's yeah. all about how you approach it. If you're attacking them, they're never going to be receptive. They're going to double down riddled with shame. And it's shameful because... At the time, it's like uh, I think both Ricky Gervais and uh, Jim Jeffries have a similar line about this. Like, you can't be upset at me for a joke I made in 2012 because I made a joke right up against the line at the time. And now Now, since that joke, that line has gone way behind where I was and now I'm over the line. But you can't be upset at me because that's where the line was. And so granddad literally watched Greg Ritchie, who is a cricket player for Queensland, do Mahatma Coat in blackface on the footy show. Yes. And it was hilarious. Yeah. And benefit of the doubt, granddad did not grow up. You know, he just was like, oh, that's a funny joke. Yeah. Because the TV's telling me that's a funny joke. So it's a funny joke. And I laughed at it. I used to laugh at those things. How come not, I can't laugh at it now? Again. It's not his fault. <laughs> and this is, th- my whole <laughs> shtick has always been like, oh, they've just run out of software updates. Like they just haven't gone into the archive and done an update and sort of recycled the information and thought, oh, do I need to, to progress this information? They've kind of given up on that a lot of a lot of my retired grandparents. You know, they're just old. And I left it alone for a really long time. And now I'm coming back to the table and saying, no, uh-uh, actually, I'm going to try while I can because it could change votes, right? But for me also, it's like I agree. I love Daniel Sloss, who's one of my favourite comedians, best. so good. One of his – I went and saw him um, in Sydney recently. Was it? Yeah. And one of oh, the we jokes – Oh, were there on the same night. Oh, are, are there more? Yeah. yeah. He, one of the things he said, which I really liked, was he was like, it's a comedian's job to navigate the audience through a minefield. Yeah. And he was like, you have to – the point is that you're on the line. The point is that you're challenging a really hot-button topic, but you're holding the hand of the audience member and leading them through and saying <gasps> – Don't go over there or look over there. There's a danger. And you're carefully. Mm. And he goes, so when people are like, I'm being cancelled, they probably just haven't done their job very well. And I agree with that. Takes so much. I really love it. I really love that. He's like, if I have offended someone, I haven't done my job as a comedian. If I'm like, fuck you, I can say whatever I want, then that's not it. Yeah. That's not it. I do believe you can joke about most things, but it's the way in which you do it. Super important. Yeah. Yeah. And that it's a part of this, but this news show that of making a fake news show. Yes. So we did it, we did it live around the, the country and stuff. And a part of that is like, and I think it's really important and I really want to get it on TV. We're shooting a thing in a couple of days from now because we can make jokes about ER nurses facing, you know, getting punched in the face by People are trying to treat at three in the morning because you can't joke about that on having been paying attention. You can't joke about it on cheap seats. Yes. You certainly, we certainly won't talk about it on the six o'clock news, but it's something we really need to fucking talk about. Yes. And the way I always find that the best way to change someone's mind is through making them laugh. Yeah. Which is a real problem. Uh, one of the things I did want to speak about, one of the things I do, I quite love that you are open about is balancing the feminism that you hold and the 
as in my wife's name, my wife's words, like fuck every, all men are pigs, like fucking pigs, <laughs> pigs. And then she still has sex with me. <laughs> yeah. So balancing that against like <laughs> who you are. Yeah. I found that really amazing. Well, it's funny because like I told this story the other day where my dad is very, I think we're having drinks at a pub at a family lunch. My whole family was there. And dad was like a bit pissed and he was like, you fucking hate men. you Because he's very, he's not good at being a feminist. He's trying hard and he is like, go for gold, Hannah. But he's not that feminist. And he was like, you fucking hate men. And I was like, yeah, here we go. Three beer Fergs fucking on it. He's letting me know. Oh, his name's Fergus? Well, no, my last name's Ferguson. Oh, right, so right, 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 We're right, both right, Fergs. Right, right. So he goes, yeah, you fucking hate men. And I was like, oh, unfortunately I have heaps of sex with them then, Dad, because I really must fucking hate them if I want to do that. And then he was like, like, <laughs> just like but It was like he went into like anaphylactic shock or something and my whole family was like, oh, Jesus. And I was like, but that's the point. I'm straight. I'm fortunate. But- this is the thing I remember <laughs> laughing at, going like, you know why I'm, I, I was like, if anyone's ever doubted that sexuality comes with you, like I fucking hate all this shit and I still want to have sex with them. Unfortunate. <laughs> but I actually think there's something, I don't know, I saw this TikTok recently too that was like um this with this guy and he was like i don't know but the best woman to date is a woman that hates men and he was like i don't know why but like those women know what's up and i was like i'll take that thank you i don't hate men i actually i I love the joke but what's funny to me is that whenever i make jokes about you know men being shit or whatever i try to say to the men who follow cheek you're actually in on this joke with me. Any man who opposes toxic forms of masculinity and the Andrew Tates of the world, you're actually laughing at this joke with me because it's not about you. And you know that when I make jokes about patriarchy, anyone who's laughing at that joke has actually escaped the expectations that a lot of traditional and dangerous masculinity imposes on men, right? And for me, as much as I do shit on men, one of my biggest pieces of the puzzle of cheek is trying to bring men into the feminist conversation and say, I want you here so bad. Yeah. And this is how I think we need you to show up and we're not talking about it. Yeah. I, I went on this I, a few months ago. I suggested to people um, on cheek, I said, what if you put cheek on your dating profile? What if as a straight woman you put one of your prompts on Hinge or Bumble or Tinder, follow Cheek Media Co.? I got a thousand men the next day because so many people put on their dating profile. And I was like, "This is how we do it. This right. is how." And I'm willing to do any any guerrilla marketing. Use sex as bait. Well, so sure, <laughs> if it gets someone to learn something, mate. I bought, my, I, I bought beers because <laughs> Alan Border. Speaking of cricketers, Alan Border was drinking four X on a on a beach uh, with uh, Tomo and and a chick in a bikini walked by. I'm like, well, clearly that's what's going to happen if I buy beer. Never did, but I kept trying. Good, keep trying. But this is the thing: all we can do is try. And I'm just like. Even if a man comes in here and is freaked out and disagrees with me, they might think about something in a different way. And if I think that one of, again, one of the biggest values of the left and feminism is that men don't feel welcome. And that's not our fault necessarily, but I think a lot of women in the feminist space are very opposed to having men here, having men involved. We aren't going to change shit unless men want to get behind this cause. So for me, it's like, even if I'm being a bit inflammatory, I actually love men and I want better for men, but that involves them giving up something, giving up power in some form to come to this side and have this conversation. I don't know if it's about giving up power Mm. because that for me pushes the idea that you're giving up something. Like uh, there's more pie than there is pie chart, all right? There really is. Mm. And in the same way that why would I why would I want to not have that many ideas that I otherwise cannot see because of the way that I grew up? Why would I not have access to those purely by not having women in the room? It's not giving up power. It's like multiplying power for that's me. That's interesting, but that's that's knowledge. In in my view it's like expanding your view of the world, but I think the I think the thing for me is men see equality as oppression. For <laughs> some men Right. Do you know what I mean? Like they see Hashtag the, not all men. <laughs> sorry. I I don't mean all men. That was hilarious. Though. But I don't. All that shit was so funny. But I really don't yeah. mean all men. But yeah. I mean that the, a lot of men, like Scott Morrison would have, I mean, he gave an IWD speech, like International Women's Day speech, where he said, you know, women should rise but not at the expense of others. Who, do you, who does he mean by others? And it's like that's someone who sees the idea of women rising as their own fall. And it, I agree with you. It's not. It's everyone stepping forward. And I think men having a better experience of the world if they don't feel the need to suppress emotion. And they, like I yeah. think that men would have a better 
livelihood if they engage in feminism. But it's this idea of scarcity. It's the idea of like Agreed. you have it's it's the problem is 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 scarcity. And if you if you don't grant it, someone else is going to. Exactly. It's like well, actually, no. Yeah. I can from my own experience making this news show, and uh, it's really, really important to me. I just want to make the most funny show I can fucking make. Yes. Right. And it's really important to me that not because I'm trying to tick a box. Yeah. Uh I need other people who have had other upbringings and from other backgrounds than me mm. involved because there's jokes I just don't see and I will never see yeah. because I do not have the lenses to look for them. Totally. I just don't have, I can't, and I miss it. And some of them, like the most, my writing team is like th- like three unfucking believable women and they write some shit that just, I'm like, I'm going to get fucking cancelled for this. But I know in my heart, if they come for me, I'm like, a woman wrote this, an amazingly smart, fucking incredible woman yes. wrote this. Here I go. <laughs> so she good. wrote it for me, knowing I would do it. And it's fucking cool. And it's hilarious. And I think like looking at like looking at it like that yeah. is the only way to look at it. This idea of scarcity or the other idea of like I can't I, I can't halve my sandwich because it's like, no, we just make another sandwich. Yeah. And now we two people have sandwiches. Yeah. Now everyone's fed and, you know, we're fed people. Don't steal shit. Hooray. So true. <laughs> this is the thing. This is my whole thing is this idea of like, oh, no, if we have equality, everything will be ruined. It's like, no, 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 no. I think we can actually all agree that in the first place we want people to have opportunity and we want people to have. Mm. I think it's this idea as well, like people who oppose like prison abolition or reform to the law, blah, 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 or, you know, reduce police powers, they go, oh, my God, we don't want to free criminals. I'm like, that's not what we're saying. What we're actually saying is we don't want the crime to have been committed in the first place. And how do you do that? You go back to the start yeah. and you make everyone's experience of the world from birth better and yeah. you actually change the social measures and factors that influence crime or influence these inequalities. And that's the change. It's not taking away something from you. It's actually giving you a better experience of the world. I can't make world. that rhyme and I can't say it in three words. But. Lock them up. <laughs> Lock them up. Like Easy. It's so frustrating. Treat them equally. <laughs> Treat that. No, doesn't no, sound the doesn't same. sound as ringy, does it? Look, look, sounds. Oh, you need the K sound. In I need there, to do an it? advertising degree or something to get more jazzy. Oh, there's people. There is we, people we like can a get, pay to do that. We can get fuck up people. So true. Of One of the things I do kind of dig about this. Uh, you, you've said that you want this book to be Alan Jones's nightmare or Andrew <laughs> Bolt's nightmare. Correct. Why is that? I think that it's not about. I would love them to read it. I would, I would seriously, if they had read it, I would love their anti endorsement. Would you go on Bolte's show? I was actually, my mum asked me this the other day. What I would like is to go on Q and A with someone like Alan Jones, or, Alan Jones or Andrew Bolt. Whereas I think that if I went on their show, the way I would be framed would be completely out of my control. Like I would obviously be able to say things, but I just don't think that I would cut through with anyone. I would still do it, but I know that it wouldn't have that much traction. Whereas I think that contrasting us on like a panel would be a much better way to do something like that because I'd feel confident. But they're never going to do that. Why not? Because they would, they don't want to ever come out of their cave because they're, there's less power. I know, but wouldn't it be so funny? It would be. <laughs> that if, would be the best rated Q&A episode ever. So, somewhere, somewhere there's, when Jimmy was campaigning, Jimmy went on Andrew's show mm. and it just, he just took him apart piece by piece like a Lego, like a Lego model. And Andrew kept trying to get him and kept trying to use all these, you know, real, it's like, it's like Lucha Libra. It's like the same moves every time. And then here comes the end. No, Andrew, that's not what I'm saying, mate. You're just completely and repositioning. Was, and he couldn't, it was wild because it was almost like, you know, when Keanu dodges out of the way of yeah. Aiden Smith, it was that stuff. And he was just flailing into the air. I reckon you'd do that. And it would be amazing. It would be funny just to watch him flail at the air. So true. And like punch a piece of air where you used to be. And I guess the thing that though for me is, yes, I would love to use that on cheek and post it and be like, hee hee, look at this. Mm. But with Sky News viewers, what would they take from it? That's my problem with it is like I would do that in order to try and challenge one of their views, but I'm not sure that it would cut through necessarily. If you went on, you know what would be really wild? Mm. If you went on and said, Andrew, I can understand why you would say that. (laughs) <laughs> just leave it. It makes sense that you feel about these things that way, mate. Of course. Of course you would feel that. And that's No, I get it. Absolutely. I get it that you're very upset about this. It looks like you're really, really feeling that deeply in your heart. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Just let it hang just in empathy. the air just empathy. for a long time. Validate him. Validate him. Just let him be. And what is he going to do with it? You know, if he's got nothing to punch Probably against. Probably run himself in a circle. Because that's the thing. Yeah. And then eventually they will, 
and one of my old bosses taught me how to do that because I was a very reactionary person at work for a while there. And he said, mate, just you don't have to relax about this. Yeah. Not everything's a fight. Not everything's a fucking arm wrestle, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so true. Pick it, your battles. Yeah. Is this a book for people to buy for their dads? Yeah. I actually hope so because I think, again, it'll be pigeonholed as the target audience being women who already know a lot of what's contained in it. But yeah. I think for me it's about actually saying you need to gift this for Christmas to the person that won't agree. Not because you need them to agree with me but because you need to challenge them. And a lot of people don't feel that they have the tools to have those conversations and I hope that either this book – can be given to that person to challenge them or that you yourself can gain the tools to have those conversations mm. outside of the book. Um, you don't need to win the argument and they don't need to agree with me. That's not the point. The point is that they take something away from it and think about something in a slightly different way. You mentioned before, but um, I was really moved by the, the Clementine Ford book, Boys Will Be Boys, mm. growing up as number two of four boys going to an all-boys school and the only because dad left when I was about 11, the only woman I knew that wasn't my accounting teacher was my mum. Mm. So I got spat out of that. Yeah. In a very weird way of looking at the world. I yeah. was about 17 I was, and it, it was hard. It was really fucking hard because much like the person that used to watch my hat, my coat on TV, mm. suddenly you're like, well, hang on, this is not okay now. It's been okay for the last, uh, it was difficult. Yeah. I, Wolfie's four. Nobody wants their son to grow up and never leave the house, just going down four chans, not a deep enough rubber hole. Eight chan, here I come. Yeah. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. But having these people in our community, like that's really, that'd be a horrible way to be. Mm. I, I, I look at the comments on stuff like that, certainly around the voice stuff I, I, I'm putting out. People are fucking terrified. Mm. I've been, I've had paranoid delusions. Mm. I have been on antipsychotics. It's a horrible place to mm -hmm. be. What's your vibe on like how do we have empathy and compassion for men who are in that space, who are the ones that send, you know, horrible death threats to Yumi? My, my friend who wrote a pretty excellent book, yes. and a number of excellent books around consent and sex and, you know, nobody wants to be that guy. Mm. What are your thoughts about what do we do about guys like that? I think it is hard because obviously I like to, I want to look at the the boys and raise them with empathy. And I'm kind of struggling between trying to have conversations with those men that I, I struggle to have empathy for. And I think that we, I think that I understand why a lot of women struggle to have any empathy for the people that perpetrate against us, right? Why should we, mm. you know? But for me, it's the fact that I know inherently that their views and the violence is actually the product of a system that sort of raised them through this lens from birth, right? And yes, they could have taken responsibility and dismantled those views. Yes, they could have. But often the very reason they are the way they are is forces that taught them that's how they had to be and that that was easier. And I don't think that the answer to any of this is actually things like prison or criminal conviction a lot of the time because I think that there's the people in our community, the Jeffrey Dahmers and the Ted Bundys, that that cannot be in society. But I think the majority it's of people... It's a really small number. Yeah, it is a really small way. number. It's That's what people don't get. It's not actually the alleyway, the dark strain, the no, dark, you know, alleyway night thing. The amount of people thing. in forensic prisons in our country is, is yeah. kind of low triple figures tops. Exactly. And so for me... There's no system of accountability that we currently have outside of something like criminal conviction. So when we have men who have taken an opportunity and been entitled and done something horrible or said something horrible, even if it's death threats, they have no recourse where they can admit to it, learn and do better. They have denial and then they have potentially confession and criminal conviction. That's a shit binary to exist in that doesn't actually get anyone anywhere. Because I think a lot of the time, and I'm not claiming to speak for everyone, but I think a lot of the time the women that sit at the centre of these stories feel very minimised and want to reclaim their story and their agency. It's actually not about seeing someone behind bars. That's actually something that would um, fill you with guilt as well. It's not an easy choice to be making. And I think that we don't have this societal conversation where we can actually open up, be honest and do better, we have this awful binary. So for me, my empathy comes from the fact that I know that society tells men just 
to show no emotion, to feel nothing, to never be self-indulgent or to care for yourself. Yes, you could dismantle that, but for the men who haven't, for the men who have lent into the toxicity of the patriarchy, I understand that that's all you ever believed you could be. And that's probably from a series of bad experiences and a belief system that was built around things that are tell you to sort of, uh, I don't think any of these men genuinely love themselves. I think that they are deeply insecure and hate themselves. And I feel sorry for them. And I actually think that's where my empathy starts because I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be so afraid of calling out your mates if they said something shit or to feel the need to constantly perform and to be this big man. I've never felt that pressure and I never will feel that pressure. And I'm so glad that I'm a woman, even though that comes with a different set of dangers and problems. And so I think that my part of the conversation starts with, I'll never understand that. I can't pretend to understand that. And I feel sorry for you. But what do we do about it? And how do we talk to each other about it that makes that change? It is an interesting world we live in to be on the other side of the release of the Barbie movie. <laughs> is it? Yeah. How do you feel about it? I feel that, well, A, Mattel, I mean, making visual content based upon the toy is nothing new mm. since um, program length commercials got shown up after Reagan deregulated things and allowed Hasbro to create the Transformers out of thin air mm. and um, sell a squillion toys uh, to children. But that Mattel would use their IP, because that story could have been told. They could have told that story and they used a football team. Yeah. They could have told that story using uh, a factory floor. But they chose to put it and they told that story in Barbie world. Yeah. And that dropped the barriers enough, I think, for people who otherwise would never have engaged in those kind of conversations or seen the world in that way to be able to go, oh, hang on. And I found I found it too. I thought it was fucking brilliant. Yeah. Personally. I thought it was absolutely extraordinary. But one of the moments that doesn't get really talked about was something I think about a fair bit. And it's a moment where, and if you haven't seen it, there may be a spoiler coming up here. It was a moment when Barbie's at a bus stop and Ken shows up in his cowboy hat. And he's like, people listen to me. People like me here. I'm allowed to say stuff. They asked me for the time. This is fucking amazing. And because I started wondering about the Andrew Tate thing. And I'm trying to wondering, like, why is a 15-year-old boy going for that? And I thought, well, what is it to be a 15-year-old boy now? Mm. It is, there's a lot of, when I look at the way that the communication of that person's cohort occurs, it happens online and things can be copy pasted, shared very, very quickly. And there is a lot of collateral in a performative uh, shaming or calling someone on the dumb thing that they have said and done. Yeah. Um, look at what fucking Braden said. Bleh. And then he might have said something dumb because he's 15. But and, and now, you know, he can't be, he may have called a woman a bitch or something, yeah. all right? As he's to high school, you don't know anything. And now he's forever the guy that called, he's, it's, it never gets to change. And it's very difficult. He can't walk into a room without, stop staring at me. I'm just walking so I don't bump into something. You know, I see videos of people at gyms. And like, oh, this guy's fucking staring at me when I'm in my gym doing my squats. Like, he's just trying to walk past you. Yeah. You can't fucking publicly shame someone. What the fuck? Yeah. And so it's becoming like, I'm not saying, well, we just can't laugh at blackface. I'm saying like, where's that young 15-year-old guy going to go? Yeah. Where he feels like I can speak and be and learn how to be in the world. I bump into things. I say the wrong things. I make mistakes. Uh, I have like, to be suddenly so full of testosterone and- be like in between what is it September? So but my birthday's in March. So I remember at fifteen being like twenty kilos heavier and more powerful six months later. Mm -hmm. Like suddenly I could go through walls. Like yes. I'm like a superhuman and unable to stop. Just just rivers of hormones flooding through my body. I was just going off like a fire hose of idiocy. But I can't. You can't stop it. You have no brakes. Mm. All right. Where's that kid going to go that he doesn't feel shame just for standing, oh, you fucking perv? Like, I'm not. I'm just trying to sit at a bus stop. Yeah. So th th when I saw that bit in Barbie, I'm like, 
I think about that kid. I've been trying to, I'm, I don't know how to put it properly, but I'm just like, I was trying to think about what if, where am I going to go where I feel like I'm okay? Oh, here's this guy. He's got a Bugatti. He's got, oh, what color is your Bugatti? That's the question they ask. What color is your Bugatti? But this is the thing. You know? I completely agree because I think that um, people like Andrew Tate, but also people like Jordan Peterson for older Fuck finance bros, bro, man. part of the issue with these people, and I speak about this a lot, is that, People want to demonize them entirely, but actually I think that usually half of what they're offering is pretty solid, right? Half of what they're offering is lifestyle content. I wouldn't give half. I would give maybe 25. I was trying to be welcoming and friendly to men there. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'd give 25. That- I thank you. Well, let's yeah, let's go with that. Twenty five mainly because he drink. If he's trying to put on muscle and he's drinking alcohol, he's clearly unaware of the hormonal regulation, yeah. like fluctuations. Well, Come on, taters. Andrew Tate is probably like a, a solid five percent, whereas I actually think Jordan <laughs> Peterson is a lot like he's how to make your bed. Like Jordan Peterson is like make your bed, change your life. I think half of him is, but he's become extremist in the last few years, bro. But I think <laughs> that mo- both of them. The space for this conversation I want to give is. You can enter a fandom through the lens of like a safe m- amount of lifestyle content, which is just like the hustle grind set mindset, which is problematic. But I understand why people are attracted to it because it's what we're taught is success in mm. a capitalist society, right? It's that cult mindset that just allows this pipeline to occur where suddenly you've gone from fancy car or fancy job to um, – Jordan Peterson, the forced sexual redistribution of women through enforced monogamy. And you get there pretty fucking quickly, right? And I get it because there actually aren't many good role models for men. There aren't. There aren't for boys. There are a lot of people trying to do good work, but a lot of the time we don't see big sports stars actually being vocal advocates beyond, you know, the paid sponsorship they're getting. Like, I I have a big problem with that because I think there's an opportunity there that's constantly missed for men to be more honest and more vulnerable. And I think that I get why boys feel so judged, but also girls feel judged by girls too. I think that's what we're missing. Like, I think that girls are empowered by the closeness and intimacy of their friendships, whereas boys are isolated by it. And I think that, as in what I mean is, girls are encouraged to have closeness and intimacy and vulnerability and honesty with with each other. That's like inherently like this viewed as this feminine, beautiful thing. Mm. Boys are demonized for that. It should just be. And I I saw this video recently that said like women have face-to-face friendship where we are having sleepovers and going to brunch and doing all this Mm. face-to-face emotional stuff. Men a lot of the time have shoulder to shoulder friendship. Yeah, that, and that's and that's fine. It's just the way men communicate. Is that totally simple, like, women talk face to face, men talk shoulder to shoulder. But often so, your yeah. friendship is built around events like drinking or sport, yeah. and you miss the stuff that allows you to be yourself. Sports okay, like sport, it, no, sports I'm not, support. But I'm saying there's nothing wrong with it. But yeah. I feel for men again in that you're not encouraged to have the depth that we are. That's yeah. not that's not as allowed. Yeah. It's it's like indulgent and it's like yeah. somehow judged. And I wish that that was different, but how do we do that? Is it on women to open that up because a lot of the time I think for men my worry is that they invest so much emotional intimacy and vulnerability only in their intimate partner and a lot of the time that in a heterosexual relationship that's women. And then when that relationship ends, say, that's when men are most at risk of mental health crises because the one person they felt safe to be vulnerable with and have that face-to-face intimacy with is gone and suddenly it's isolation and it's a mental health decline. And that's where we have these pipelines to people like Tate as well for older guys. Yeah. And this loneliness thing, it starts at with 15-year-old boys who don't feel heard. And how do we eradicate that and challenge that? I don't know the answer besides open conversation and honesty from a really young age. I, that is a good answer. Thanks. <laughs> but thank you. I was, I was trying to find a way. I tried to do a whole podcast about it, but it didn't come out right. I didn't know how to speak about that because I do. But it's hard. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's difficult. Because you don't want to feel, and this is the thing, is that we're all afraid of sounding like, literal rapist sympathizers. Yeah. That's what we're afraid of. We're afraid of sounding yeah. like we are sympathizing or forgiving heinous acts. But I think that there's something to be said for the way that we subvert the narrative from an early age. Because, yes, I want to have a conversation with the guys that are – I don't think anyone can't be redeemed. I don't think anyone's purely good or bad. And that's the other part of this is that we're so willing to be like evil. They're in the basket and they're there forever. No, no, no. It's, I don't actually yeah, believe in that. It's spy versus spy. It's, it's I don't believe spaghetti in that. westerns. It's white hat, white gun, yeah. black hat, black gun. Easy. 
Yes. Done. And I don't think it's anyone's responsibility to fix or forgive that person, but I want it to be mine. I yeah, actually right. think my life's work is going to be saying, I want to have a conversation with that person because that's the person society has decided is irredeemable. It's, it's really tough, you know, because you live in a part of the city that is quite high density, you know, uh, your neighbour, you get a new neighbour, they're moving in. How you doing? Yeah, really good. Yeah, where have you been for the last, you know, oh, look, I just got back to Sydney. I just got a new job. That's great. Where have you been? Oh, Goldman. I was there 15 years. <laughs> oh, how, what did you do there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it was my ex. I lived a very different life then and I, you know, it was really bad. And um, she's okay now. She can walk again. But I'm a different person now. Like you talk about forgiveness, but yeah. this is essentially this is what our prison system is. Like how long did that person who's probably mid thirties, if they made that choice when they were in their twenties, fifteen years later they've been sitting in the green jumpsuit, you know, and now they're trying to get back into life. How long do they need to be in that green jumpsuit before we're okay for them to live next door? You but know? I don't even think that most green jumpsuits are ever gonna be the thing that fixes. That's the problem, and that, I, that's the thing. I agree with you on that. Yeah, that answer, that itself answers the question about prison reform, right there and there. It's like no, lot, no time is long enough for any of us to go. Fine, no, he's my new boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he spent you know a long time at Silverwater, but you know now he's here and he's great. Mm -hmm. Love him because we don't trust. I don't think it's anything, uh, but that's that's a long story. Uh, I was interested though. You talked about the swipey swipey dating apps, mm. which I spent a bit of time on, and they were the worst fucking thing in the world. They before, are. And that's fucking hellscape I work one of my jobs is um is based around dating mm. I do know this are you so, so, are you about to ask me to be the next bachelorette <laughs> a, I think it'd be fucking amazing at it it would be I would love it's hilarious as you a concept would be to me the best you would be up there with the you know with Brooke Blurton I think because she's our greatest ever of all time <laughs> um hmm. what is dating like Really horrible. <laughs> I'm also six foot two. How old were you when you were six foot two? Probably sixteen. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Well, mm. like I know, I know someone who was six foot one at twelve. Whoa. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. Yeah. Sixteen. That's that's still uh, not great. I struggle with it because I have. A, I don't know. This is a bit lame. That's not so vulnerable talking about dating. I was in a relationship for three years and it ended in January of last year and I haven't dated since really. Like I've been, I saw one person and I haven't been on a date, a first date in over a year. Wow. And it's me really struggling with the idea of intimacy genuinely yeah. because I am also really struggling as a feminist. I do struggle to date men. I do, as much as I make jokes about it, I am quite scared and I also now have a public platform and I feel like dating has a new meaning because I could tell someone I could go on a date with someone and once they find out what I do, they could have access to every thought I've ever had pretty much. Right. And that's scary to me. That's really scary. And I, again, know that I want to be in a relationship and I'm not good at casual hookup culture and the things that society wants at the moment. I'm an emotional gal. It bothers me, man. It bothers I'm, me too. I meet, I meet guys on this show and I'm like, you're Hang on, what? You're 28 and you've never introduced a woman to your parents? Yeah. Because they've never had to, Hannah. Yeah. Because this transactional nature of but, the, you know, it's fucking bonkers. And man. this is my problem is because I think that so many women accept the bare minimum because we've been, again, there's this new lowered standard of what we expect in dating. And I, I, this, I don't know if this, apparently this is a controversial take. Every time I talk about it, people seem to be weirded out by it. I think that most women are lying to themselves about this casual dating culture and enjoying it. I don't think we do. And I think that what it does is it asks us to provide all of the best elements of a relationship, sex, intimacy, and sort of feelings of love, even if it's not there yet, without commitment and without the return. And I refuse to do that. I refuse to give intimacy to someone who is not in taking me on a date. And I don't think that's traditional. I think it's basic respect. There's a name There's a name for that uh, for people who uh, make a living out of sex work. They call it the girlfriend experience. That's, but that's, ex I refuse to be someone's <laughs> pre-wife. It's, some it's, it's like, it's a couple of, ten, it's like 10, 50K. I remember I read an article about yeah. it. It was a lot of these people pay me 50K for a weekend 
I offer the girlfriend experience. Yeah. That's a, a pay me. It's on a list of things it, you can you can get. But that's exactly <laughs> it. And it's like I know that I I think there's this thing where it's like you expect a lot. Like my parents are like well you're really difficult. And I'm like I don't think I'm really difficult. I think that I have expectations and I think that I want someone that I can converse with because I'm actually more interested in the personality piece and being challenged, not agreed with, challenged and someone who wants to have am- who someone who is ambitious and not even successful but ambitious. I want someone to be my equal, and I think that not many men are interested in that. You need to start a dating app. I think you're probably right. Fucking immediately, but I want you to start it as a live experience. Okay. I want you to start it as a live experience and go, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to do it once every three months. You know, it's going to be this many women and this many men. Bear in mind, men, if you're showing, and you screen everybody. Yep. You get on the phone, you charge a fee. Yeah. It's essentially a matchmaking. Yeah. All right. Because people charge this shit anyway. Yeah. You know? And it's probably better than Hinge or Tinder. Fucking oath it is. Mm. Could you imagine going like, well, I'm going to be in a room with, it's a a day. Yeah. Don't make it a night. Too much pressure. And you don't want alcohol or anything. You just want people to be genuinely coming to the table. It's a picnic. It's whatever. Mm. And there's, you know, this, there's that, there's, there's whatever. And, you know, you you find ways to have people mingle and yeah. whatever you you know you get someone to MC it. I don't know what the fuck. Yeah, and no one gets anyone's details. No one gets anyone's. There's no pens and papers. There's nothing until the very very very, very like the mm. day like the week later when they write back to you and go, I really is interested in this person because they'll have to have remembered their names. This person, this person, this person, and if that person writes to you and says, I was interested in this person, this person, this person, you go, then I will I will connect you. What cut do you want? <laughs> I'll be a, I'll be a part of it. I'll help you make it that because be I think great. it's vital. But I think also like that's a show. It is a show that's different that actually brings people. It is. I, I also wonder if um if that's a new format. Like there's been a lot of like you know new dating shows that sort of predicated on the drama. But what if it was on the substance? Well. We could talk about that, but I think a proof of concept is we make it live. Fine. We make it as a we'll live s- event we'll first. We'll do baby steps. I think that you, what you're asking of me is fair in the initial we phase. A, we do it as a live event first. And um, like you think about think about who'd show up. All right. You know, you'd want, obviously, you know, you'd want people who are 18 and up. Um, you may want to instigate a look. You might be 48 as a man showing up here. And bear in mind, there are 18 year old people here. You can't. It's half your age plus seven or nothing. I agree with that. All right. The half your age plus seven is the best test. For uh, To a point. To a point. Yeah, obviously, you can't go below like, we, we're talking adults. Yeah, like if I'm 60 and I'm dating, a, I'm marrying a 37 year old. Dep- no. Mm. Uh, See, I always think it works for me. For you at 25, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. No, but I think it like it works for me because someone who's older than me is fine usually. But I I also see some women. I'm like, that's not safe. What yeah, you're doing. This is true. Yeah. Look, I've I have I have experience in the dating world. Mm. I think a live event would be particularly great. Yeah. And you call it Cheek Summer Picnic or something. That's lovely. And Look you, at you. You know what you do it on? You do it on January 26th to give someone people to do some people give people something to do that day. That's actually a good idea. You are that's why you're in the biz. I'm here to, I'm here to help. You do have experience with dating and hosting. <laughs> here to help. 